Good day class. My name is Harun Gambusondi. I'll be taking you introduction to biochemistry, BCH 121. Uh, in this course, we are going to be looking at the following contents. Number one, composition of living matter. Uh, for this session, this is what we are going to be looking at. And um, under the composition of living matter, we shall be looking at macromolecules. And these macromolecules include carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, lipids. Then in addition to that, we have water and other metabolic intermediates, as well as inorganic ions. Now, as a way of introduction, um, we are going to be looking at the components of living, uh, living matter. Now, from the evolution of life, we suggested that living organisms are made up of chemical substances. It has been confirmed after a lot of structural biochemistry research that all living organisms from microbes to animals are composed of chemical substances which are both inorganic and organic in nature. Of all the natural existing elements, over 100 of them, only about 31, that is 28%, occur in living organisms. Among those present, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen make up 96.3% of the total weight of living organisms, which, in addition, with phosphorus and sulfur, met more than 99%. Constituents of human body. In the human body, there are elements that are contained. Of course, the, you, are, you are familiar with the elements in the periodic table. So these elements as you already know them in the periodic table, are also part of the human body. They are also part of the building block that leads to the overall existence of a human body, what is known as a human body. So some of these elements that are present in the human body include hydrogen, and hydrogen is made up of about 60%. Oxygen is comprised of up to 22.5%. Carbon is 10.5%. Nitrogen is 2.4%. Calcium is 0.22%. Phosphorus is 0.13%. Sulfur is 0.13 percent. Potassium is 0.03 percent. Sodium is 0.03 percent as well. And magnesium is also 0.03 percent. Now, each of these elements has one role or the other to play, to play in ensuring a stable physiological state. That is in ensuring that the body functions properly. Now, hydrogen is important because it forms one of the bases for the existence of hydrogen bonds between uh, smaller molecules leading to the formation of larger ones. Then oxygen, of course, you are aware that oxygen is part of water. And oxygen 
play other roles in the system. Apart from being part of water, which is important in the body, oxygen serves as the electron acceptor in the electron transport chain in the oxidative phosphorylation. So what that means is that oxygen plays a role in respiration and as well as in energy production, that is the formation of ATP. Later in your studies, you are going to be taught the theory of chemiosmosis, where the electron transport chain is coupled with ATP formation. So in that regard, you see the important role of oxygen there serving as the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. Then carbon. Carbon, of course, you all know that it serves as the basis for the formation of multiple bonds leading to the formation of macro molecules in the system. Then nitrogen is also an important element in the sense that it uh, forms the basis for most proteins in the system. And that is why it is usually gotten from the breakdown of proteins. Then we have cashew. You must be aware that cashew play a, a, a key role in bone formation and in tooth formation and strengthening. We have phosphorus, we have sulfur, we have potassium, sodium, and magnesium, <clears throat> which play different roles as electrolytes. They form the electrolytes components of the system. And you know that electrolytes are very important in ensuring the osmotic balance of the human system. Then macromolecules. Like I said earlier, macromolecules are large molecular substances that are formed by the polymerization of smaller ones. So amongst some of the smaller molecules that come together to form macromolecules include hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, sulfur, and phosphorus. And they combine in different forms to serve as building blocks for the macromolecules. Now the macromolecules include carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids, which are organic in nature. So you can see that the macromolecules which are organic in nature are formed from the elemental units that you already know. So it's a matter of smaller components coming together to form larger components that also aggregate together to form the macro molecules. So now you can see the hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, as you can see in this uh, graph, or in this chart, sorry, you have hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, and sulfur coming together to form nucleotides, amino acids, simple sugars, acetyl-CoA, and the, the aggregation of this eventually leads to the formation of macromolecule, the macromolecules. Now, these are the macromolecules here, the nucleic acids, the proteins, the polysaccharides, and lipids. So again, it is important for you to know that these macromolecules are very important to the system. And that is why they need to be formed.
So any system that is is deficit or def deficient of any of these macromolecules will be plunged into a disease state. For instance, a problem in the nucleic acid can lead to genetic diseases. Then proteins, there are a lot of diseases that are associated to protein malfunction or malfunctioning. We also have a lot of problems that are associated with uh, excessive or deficient polysaccharides. Then again, we have lipid associated problems when lipids are not properly formed. So at this level, this is all you, uh, all you need to know. Then by the time you step further, in our studies, you will be told the, the, the pathways that lead to the formation of these macromolecules. Here you are just seeing uh, arrows simply pointing down to them. But uh, going further in your studies, you get to understand that there are multiple reactions that take place for these macromolecules to be formed. Now, in living organisms, there are generally four classes of macromolecules, which I mentioned earlier. They include the nucleic acids, proteins, polysaccharides or carbohydrates, and then lipids. And they are formed from amino acids. So proteins are formed from amino acids, polysaccharides are formed from simple sugars. Acetyl-CoA is also formed, it's an intermediate of uh, both lipids, sugar or polysaccharide and protein metabolism. So acetyl-CoA is actually an intermediate, an intermediate molecule. Now these macromolecules exist in various types, in different cell types and tissue and tissue based on their functions. So the existence of these macromolecules vary from tissue to tissue based, based on the particular function of that tissue or that organ. You can see the percentage compositions here or the various uh, macromolecules. Now, the remaining 1% constitutes minor elements which are inorganic in nature with various functions. The first category of them is meta, metals such as sodium, potassium ions, essential for the transmission of nerve impulse, and calcium is required for muscle contraction. So calcium and phosphorus are metals essential for teeth and bone formation. These metals, when combined with other compounds, can become acids, base, or salts. Acids and base, bases are very important in the control of the acidity, that is the pH of the body, especially weak acids and weak base, which serve as buffer to maintain the body's pH with very strict limits, close to the neutral pH of seven. Various buffers in the body includes protein buffer, blood buffer, hemoglobin, phosphate buffer, and carbonic buffers, etc. Salts such as sodium chloride and potassium chloride make up the main ionic constituents of a fluid's bulk outside and inside cells and control the movement of water and other substances into the cell. The other category of uh, metals is the 
trace elements such as ion, iodine, copper, zinc, etc., which are required in very small amounts, less than 0.01%. Most of these trace metals serve as cofactors for enzymes and are required for their activation and catalytic activity. So this is trying to let you know that these various components of the cells have functions ranging from the macromolecules to the smallest elemental components. There are functions and each of the functions is important to the body's well-being. Now, these are the percentage. The table here is a, is a, it shows the percentage composition of major, um, the major components of the cell. So, water constitutes seventy percent. Proteins constitute eighteen percent. Nucleic acid seven percent. Sugars three percent. Lipids two percent. Intermediates. 2%, inorganic ions, 1%. So now, we are going to be looking at the macromolecules one after the other. The first is nucleic acid. The word nucleic acid originated from the Greek words poly, meaning several, and me, meaning unit. Hence, nucleic acid are nucleotide polymers that store and transmit genetic information. Nucleic acid contains mainly five different nucleotides, nucleotide bases, which serve as their building blocks for biosynthesis. Now, these nucleotide bases include adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine for DNA. Why? Why um, uracil replaced thymine in RNA molecules? These nucleotide bases in DNA in the cell exist as chromosomes. Within the chromosomes are genes which carry specific genetic information which can be expressed to direct chemical process in the cell. So now, nucleic acids one of the macromolecules play majorly the role of uh, information passage in the genetic makeup of an individual or the genetic makeup of a cell. So the major function of the nucleic acid is that they are part of the DNA which transmits information, uh, genetic information in the cell. Then another macromolecule under consideration here is the carbohydrate. Carbohydrates, also known as polysaccharides, are molecules formed from the polymers or from the polymerization of simple sugars. The name polysaccharide was derived from the Greek word saksha, meaning sugar or sweetness, hence saccharide. So, they consist of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen only, with a ratio of hydrogen to oxygen of about 2 to 1, 2 to 1. The simple forms of carbohydrates are termed sugars. These simple sugars are either monosaccharide with just a single sugar, I mean sugar unit, or disaccharide with, a, uh, which, which are form from two monosaccharides. Larger carbohydrates with several monosaccharide units are called polysaccharides. Certain polysaccharides contain only one kind of sugar and are called homogeneous polymers. What that means is that um, a polysaccharide that contains only one polymer of simple sugar, for example, if a polysaccharide comprised of only glucose, then that polysaccharide 
is a homogeneous polymer. Then another example is a polysaccharide that contains only monomers of galact uh, galact galactose. So any polysaccharide containing only one simple sugar is an homogeneous polymer. Then, for example, again, glycogen and starch are polymers of only glucose. So most homogeneous polysaccharides usually serve as storage and structural purposes. Why heterogeneous polysaccharides are those that contain different types of sugar units. Some polysaccharides can serve as, as functional and structural components of cells. Example, glycoproteins and glycolipids. Then lipids. The name lipids was derived from the Greek word lipos, meaning fat. Lipids are another category of naturally occurring macromolecules which are non-polar substances and mostly insoluble in water except for short-chain volatile fatty acids and ketone bodies. They are generally soluble in non-polar solvents such as chloroform and ether. The simplest type of lipid is called the triglycerols or tri glycerides. They are formed from fatty acids and glycerol. Now lipids could be saturated based on the presence of only single bond or unsaturated based on the presence of double or triple bonds. At room temperature, saturated lipids are solid while unsaturated are liquid. Some lipids are conjugated to proteins known as lipoproteins for their transportation in the system. So we have inorganic substances also forming part of the cell. Although most of the human body or cell is organic in nature, containing carbohydrates, protein, lipids, and nucleic acids, a small portion of it is inorganic. The inorganic elements, based on their function, are subdivided into three categories. The macro minerals, trace elements, and ultra trace elements, which I've mentioned earlier, that uh, some of them form the electrolyte components of the body fluids, like sodium ion, potassium ion, and so on. Also, the trace elements such as zinc, zinc, ion, and copper are essential for the body. They function as cofactors for enzymes, structural components of non-enzymatic macromolecules. So water is also an important component of living cells. And uh, no water is the most is referred to as the most abundant molecule and is present in living uh, organisms. In the cell, we have already seen that water constitutes about 70%, and the importance of water in the living cell or in the system cannot be overemphasized as it serves as a universal solvent. So thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, you can direct them to me, maybe via my phone lines or when we meet in the physical class. You can also direct them to the class rep who will forward it to me. Thank you so much. Till we meet again in the next class.